Hi, Paul. Hey, Jackie. So I'm supposed to tell my friends about movies I've never seen. Do you want to hear a movie I've never seen? Oh, God. Yep, I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so the movie is Ferris Bueller's Day Off. (sighs) You've never seen Ferris Bueller? I've never seen it. I mean, I know the line where he's like, Bueller, Bueller, and I assume that's when he takes his day off. I mean, per the title, he does take a day off. Okay, so that's easy to guess. <laughs> I, If I were to guess the plot, I'm going to guess it's like Matthew Broderick plays a high schooler. He decides that school's boring and he wants to like, I don't know, maybe like go to some arcade or something. There's probably a love interest and then he gets in trouble at the end. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty good. I, I won't spoil it for you, though. Well, I mean, I feel like I got it just based on your reaction, but I'm excited to go see what Ferris Bueller does on his day off. I'm excited too. Welcome to Jackie Watches Stuff. This is a podcast chronicling my cinematic quest to finally watch the movies I probably should have already seen. And I'm bringing my friends along with me. So, Paul, I feel like I should have in the background to start off this part of the show. I was, I was about to say, is it inappropriate if I just go like, bow, bow, like every like 15 minutes just to... I feel like you just have to throw in like a, oh yeah, because you have the deep oh, voice. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. That was so Thank good. So you. that's pretty much the whole movie, I guess. That's is... it. So it was a good run. Great, great podcast. Great. Thanks so much for coming. Um, but no, I feel like if for listeners who like me had not seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, I have to give a 30 second recap of the movie ready and go okay so ferris bueller is a super sly dog and he wants to get out of school in the 80s because it's kind of like nice outside but there's still clouds whatever fine so he fakes sick and his parents are loving and believe him like they always do apparently and then he bullies his friend cameron who is like actually dying of some weird illness to get come over and like drive him around they get into a bunch of shenanigans and they get out Ferris Bueller's girlfriend from school and then all of a sudden go to downtown Chicago and then Ferris Bueller has to race his sister home and then he still tricks his parents. <sighs> Ooh, that was 30 seconds. I did it. I feel really yeah. proud of myself. That No, that's a very uh, concise synopsis. I, I think the only thing that was missed is the, is the B plot of Edward Rooney trying to uh, ruin his future, but it's Ferris Bueller, so nothing bad happens to him. Right. I forgot about that that is a really big plot this movie is on netflix i found it on netflix which i realized probably meant it was a good movie to do um for this show and i loved the fact that matthew broderick right off the bat and throughout the movie is like breaking the fourth wall and that's like a really big piece of this movie oh it's it's phenomenal it's it's amazing story writing I I don't know what the vibe was at that time. I know this movie actually came out the same year Top Gun came out. And so that's a very different vibe, but Mm -hmm. it just felt, it felt a little different than any other movie that probably was coming out around that time. Yeah. It's like, it was really interesting where, and obviously I wasn't alive in the eighties myself. So sorry that I'm a little young, (laughs) but there was a vibe that, you know, Ferris Bueller is always compared to Marty McFly of Back to the Future. And like Ferris Bueller is, you know, both are cool. They're like cool guys, but like Marty McFly is a slacker and Ferris Bueller is just this like, kind of like, as as said in the movie, he's just a righteous dude. Like he's, you know, everything happens to him (laughs) and it works out for him. (laughs) Yeah. I read that that line was actually one of many that was improvised. And now it's like, super well known and i didn't even realize that it was that movie when it happened i was like oh that's this movie i had no idea (laughs) and it's so funny that's like one of the few lines that is quoted all the time you know obviously you know bueller bueller everybody knows Mm -hmm. that um but the one for me is the uh um oh my gosh they're they're at the cubs game swing bada 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 he can't he can't hit he can't hit swing bada that's well I thought that was kind of like a everybody does that thing. I am not a baseball fan. So <laughs> when I go to baseball games, I do it all the time, but I do it as Cameron Fry. 
<laughs> I think that's a good way to do it. I'll have to start doing that now, even though, I mean, when's the next time I'm going to watch baseball? Let's be real. Oh, God. But we should get into the movie. Mm-hmm. So we get, there's an MTV pl- flashback to when it was like actually good because MTV was a huge thing in the late 80s when it had come out, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And we see Ferris Bueller, a.k.a. very, very small Matthew Broderick, come out and be like, oh, my God, it's so nice outside. And the camera takes extra time to show, like, there's clouds in the sky. It's like one of those, like, there's not a lot of clouds, but there's some clouds. And I was like, oh, sure, Ferris, this is a great day to take off of school. What? Like, (laughs) I know they're in Chicago where the weather is mostly shitty, but really, this is why we're going to get out of school? I don't know. I mean, I've always thought that since he... You know, this was his ninth time skipping school that, Mm -hmm. you know, he was just using the weather as an excuse. And, you know, it it did look like a lovely day. Um, It was lovely. It 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 was just more of an excuse. Like, eh, it's my ninth time. It's a nice day. Or seventh or sixth or fifth because we can hack computers in the 80s like that, which I know with computer hacking is possible. It was just hilarious to me that you've got this big old school, like, throwback i mean at the time not a throwback but he can suddenly just get in and kind of slowly reduce his uh absence count one by one (laughs) no it's it was so deliberately done too and you know it's it's just classic ferris you know he's he's making the best of what he has and you see that throughout the movie he doesn't have a lot but he makes do with what he has i don't know i mean like ferris bueller is more of like kind of like an ideal of, of like of like how one can you know maneuver slyly as you said through these like weird life scenarios and you know it it just kind of shows you how entrenched he is in you know culture you know yep well he's he's like a apparently a legend at school because you've got like random freshmen calling him on the payphone in the school which I, my phone or my school never had payphones but you got <laughs> freshmen calling him on payphones they're passing the payphone around and everyone's like oh hey it's ferris and they're like raising money for him and that hey ferris how's your bod (laughs) that through line plot i think was was wonderful truly i don't think it was necessary for the movie but i'm so glad it was there like just it was beautiful to me truly yeah it was it was so funny and and just the fact that everyone and like towards the end of the movie, you know, Charlie Sheen and, you know, everyone at the police station just knew who Ferris was. Oh, you're, you're Ferris's brother. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Oh, yes. Phenomenal. What I did learn though, I should mention, I learned about the house that they shot in. I didn't like know I was going to find anything out about this, but it's like just some random family's house that they knocked on the door one day and they said, Hey, we need your house for 10 days. We're going to shoot in it. And they said, okay, fine. Um, so the family that lived there at the time, the Balkmans, they don't live there anymore, but Mm -hmm. I guess they just let this crew come in and use like one of the son's rooms for Ferris's room. And they had to do some tweaks like the intercom system. Um, I guess they had to drill that hole in the fence that, um, Rooney looks through to see the dog. They had to add the dog door, um, And there's this like anecdote that goes around and I don't know how true this is because I feel like, you know, everything on the internet obviously is true, but they unplugged the refrigerator because it was making too much noise during takes. And I guess they spoiled all the food in the fridge. And so the Balkman family made a thousand dollars off of this because they got their food spoiled, (laughs) which like, it's like Ferris Bueller was shot at my house and all I got was a thousand (laughs) dollars. I find that fascinating. I actually, you know, funny enough, I, I, as much as I have watched this movie and I've dove into it, I actually never knew that that is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it's like one of those things where you don't, because it's TV magic, right? Like they can make houses, they can make anything. But in any case, yes, it was shot in like a regular old home. So that was pretty interesting. That is interesting. I I, I love hearing new stuff, especially with like the food that again, that I find that fascinating. It's so weird. I mean, like, honestly, at that point, it's like, no, no, I If I knew that they were going to be over, I wouldn't even bother putting food in my fridge. But who knows? Also who true. Knows? But we see the house a lot because they end up, I mean, Ferris is there, obviously, in the beginning, and he's, like, dancing around and doing his thing. And then he bullies Cameron. Poor Cameron. Can we just, <laughs> like, pour one out for Cameron, man? Who he gets bullied so hard. 
trying to, like he's like dude i'm i'm so sick i'm so actually sick like please stop calling but also come on cameron like if you're gonna be friends with ferris bueller you know what you're getting into like you you knew you knew you knew he definitely knows and and cameron is i think my favorite character in the whole movie just absolutely you know, he has like the little nuances and he's so goofy and then you know, I know that we're jumping ahead, but he has that existential moment at the art museum. And it's just like, it's so funny. Oh, my God. Yes, it's it's amazing. Well, even like the way that he's like going back and forth between going inside and going to his car, like he's going to keep calling me and I'm not going to let him. He's going to bother me. He's just going to keep calling. It's like it's the the constant turmoil that he is dealing with inside of himself that very <laughs> becomes very clear at the art museum and beyond is beautiful to me it is it is hilarious and, and then at the end of it he he just he he always goes along with whatever ferris is doing yes. and, and and he finds joy in it he realizes that you know like that it is fun even though he hasn't you know quote seen anything good today it, he still is getting joy out of what Ferris is making him do. It's awesome. Exactly. Well, that's the thing too. And I wrote it in all caps. I wrote a Ferrari Cameron. You knew what you were getting into. Like after they pick up or they, they make the call and they get in the weird fight in uh, Ferris's kitchen when Cameron's pretending to be Sloan's dad and Ferris is like, well, what are we going to do? We have to go pick her up. And he's like, Oh, I know what we're going to do. Like Cameron, you, why would you even present it to Ferris as an option? Like, why would you put him close to this thing? Like, that's on you. Um, you advised me before I watched this movie not to Google anything about the actor John Hughes. Or I'm sorry, not John Hughes. That's the Jeffrey that's the Hughes. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. Jeffrey Jones. You have, yes, you advised me not to Google Jeffrey Jones before watching this movie, and I did not. And then I Googled him, and I learned a couple things. Um, mm -hmm. I learned that he is from Buffalo, seemingly. Mm -hmm. um, he actually went to high school in Vermont, which is funny because, Paul, that's where you are. Exactly. Um, and that's where both you and I are from, is Buffalo. And uh, he also is a sex offender, there's so yeah. many criminals in <laughs> acting. <laughs> what is going on? It's it's what? so it, it's so bad. And, and and yeah, like he's he was in a lot of people know him from Beetlejuice also. I don't know if that's yes. on your list, but um but yeah, he was he was another big actor in the 80s, um early 90s and um and then in 2006, he was he it, it wasn't I I don't think that it was actual like he molested a child not to get graphic on this podcast it, it was it was child pornography i think it was possession of like way too much child pornography which is how much is too much paul <laughs> <laughs> well well one is too much but like apparently it was yep. like it was, it was it was it was no it was like hard drive upon hard drive of child pornography so oh dear not great and then as you watch it it's kind of like mm, yep i see it now just got it feels a little uncomfortable but you know, he, I will say, did a great job in his role. The the argument that he's having with his secretary, who's like making him crazy. And, you know, Sloan's quote, father is on the phone. And he says, I need you to produce a corpse, which is the most terrifying three words I've ever heard produce a corpse, like in a <laughs> row. Um, like, I think he did a great like seriously a great job in that scene it was very very funny um to watch him just get so angry but then he just mm -hmm. kind of turns into like creepy villain which i know was really the intention of that role but um mm -hmm. i'm glad he got kicked in the face in any case he is on a mission to prove that ferris is behind all of this and says the phrase produce a corpse which is very very uncomfortable um so they pick up sloan and they do the like they show up in the Ferrari and then you hear the chicka chicka, which is beautifully timed. And then Ferris like makes out with her in front of the principal. <laughs> like, All right. So that's how they do it in their family. Yep. Here we are. Um, and then they go out and they like have a day on a town on the town in Chicago, which like, okay. Seemingly the parents are home at six. We know that they say that in the movie. We know that Cameron probably didn't come over until what, maybe 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. Then they had to pick up Sloan. 
how are we how are we doing all these things before six? Like it was very suspend disbelief to me because like I don't know where they live in comparison to Chicago. True. I imagine not in the city because they had to drive there and on the highway. Like it well, was just a lot of things. Funny enough, you uh, uh, like when I rewatched it again, I was like, wow, this this timeline is really funky with with how much they crammed in. Um, my my thought was that you know he when when his parents left that morning and when Jeannie left and she went to um school it, ferris must have called cameron within I, I would assume within half an hour of them leaving so i mean assuming that they left at like 7 30 in the morning like he's on the phone with cameron at eight cameron's probably at the bueller house by nine and then they have sloan in tow by like 9 30 or 10 maybe I feel like we're now sliding into like serial podcast and we're trying to recreate timelines. And I kind of well, like <laughs> the one, the one thing that I'm actually taking away, if you want a little bit of trivia. So they go to the Cubs game um, yes. and the Cubs Cubs always played. No, sorry. Up until I think it was 2014 Wrigley field never had stadium lights. So, so there was never ever a night game at Wrigley field until 2014 so i know that back in the 80s the game had to have started at one o'clock and then okay. you know who knows how long they stayed at the game but that's kind of what i'm gauging because they did have lunch at the french restaurant before they went to the game oh you're right i didn't think about that that they went for lunch and they had they they stole the noon reservation that's a good yes. point you have another time yes. stamp all <laughs> right well i mean I don't know. I guess Cameron is just very, very, uh, has a weak backbone when it comes to Ferris that he got convinced so quickly <laughs> to come over um, as he was feeling so sick. But I guess I could believe it. Speaking of the lunch reservation, I Googled to see if there was an actual Sausage King. There is a real Sausage King in Chicago, um, but his name is not Al or whatever it is. His name Abe is Doug. Uh, oh, Abe. That's it. Not Al. You're right. Uh, so his name is not Abe. His name is Doug and his nickname is Hot Doug and I googled way too deep in this um so if you search for the Sausage King or Hot like Hot Doug in Chicago um he just put out a movie called Hot Doug's the movie premiered in June um and they also have a podcast called oh Nick and gosh. Doug's Sound Explosion. I have not listened to it, but I will read you the description oh of the Real Sausage Kings podcast. Um, two middle-aged quote, or I'm sorry, two middle-aged parentheses and devilishly handsome men discuss, ponder, confront, question, and rarely answer the glut of life's mysteries and also updates on Columbia University's athletics except soccer because Doug hates soccer. It's starring Doug Schoen, who is hot Doug, the sausage King and Nick Marcos, who is apparently called the hit maker who I don't know who that is, but yes, it's a podcast called Nick and Doug sound explosion, a pure podcast for now people. I am not endorsing this podcast. I have not listened to it, but it looks like they are actively like putting out episodes. So there is a sausage King and he is like, out there you can get t-shirts you can watch the movie like apparently though you can't take his reservation for noon this is <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating and, and i don't know if i'm fascinated with the fact that there is an individual who fits abe froman's description in chicago or or if it's the fact that you did the most detailed dive yes, on, on on a minuscule footnote in the movie. Bravo. It was, just, it was like, it stuck out to me. So I was like, wait a minute. That's like a very weird, because Sausage King sounds kind of like tongue in cheek a little bit, but also I'm, you know, slightly immature sometimes. So I was like, let me just check this. And it turns out there is someone that's like donned the Sausage King, but he's a hot dog guy. So, that's you know. so funny. So yeah, there's my little promo for Sausage in Chicago. <laughs> Everybody, go and check out Nick and Dave's Sound Explosion, but know that we aren't a sponsor. Yes, this is not me endorsing it. I have not listened to it. It might be terrible. Who knows? Or it might be genius. It could be the next serial. Oh my God. Well, so anyway, this Ferrari becomes like 
not I don't want to say it becomes a character because I don't want to like deeply analyze Ferris Bueller's day off of all things but like it's kind of like it's so like Cameron is so deeply connected to this thing because he hates it yet cares for it with his entire life right like his dad is like apparently loves this thing more than he loves him and he feels disrespected and like he doesn't have a dad and at the same time he wants to like make sure it doesn't get ruined um and also believes ferris when he's like oh we'll just put it in reverse to take the miles off like no really i thought that ferris was kidding and like really that's the that's the plan (laughs) yeah and like even even to the point where like i got my license and was still convinced at the time of getting my license that driving a car backwards would remove miles from the car. Um, you really thought that? I, I I will admit to have believing that when I was you know sixteen years old. Wow. Um, I know, I know, but I but I, I guess, agree with you. Well, go ahead. I was gonna say I guess I didn't believe it. Put it on the car, but take it off the car. I mean, I know. Yeah, it's not one of my finer moments. And thank you for totally getting rid of my pivot there. Um, oh, sorry, pivot. What? <laughs> what? What were we talking no, about? Like, I don't even remember. <laughs> no, but for those for those old cars, you can you can actually pop the glass off the odometer and yeah. roll by hand the the you know the numbers back. Which I'm I'm interested in as to why Ferris didn't do that in the movie. Because that that was a thing with those old dial odometers on cars. Right. And it didn't even look like there was glass on it, which I mean, I know we get the super tight shot of it, but it's like, you probably could have just done that on its own. But then he offers that as a suggestion. He's like, oh, well, Cameron, why don't we just pop it off and, and roll it back? And oh, he Cameron, does. No, we can't touch it. Yeah. It's like, no, he's like, no, we can't touch it. I'm like, dude, you already drove it like several hundred miles further than your dad knows about. Like, just like go lean in, man. Just lean in. But Cameron is simultaneously like super scared and being the voice of reason, but is also a pushover the entire time where he's like, no, guys, we can't like, no, we can't take this guy's lunch reservation. No. Yeah, we can. Okay. I guess we'll do it. Like, that's just what he does. It's just what he does. It's true. And, and I, what I love about Cameron so much is that, you know, I, I think I said it in the promo that Ferris Bueller is kind of like the, it's kind of like the Seinfeld of movies where it's, there's no real plot to it. It just, it's, it's yes. what they do and the things that, that happen to them. Um, and, you know, Ferris and um, Sloan do not have character arcs. Rooney does, but in a way where it's like, aha, foiled, yeah. But, but Cameron genuinely has a character arc of, yeah. you know, coming to terms with, you know, he has a shit father and he's going to stick up for himself for once. And that's so redeeming about him. Absolutely, yeah. And I I wish there was like, ferris bueller or like cameron fry's freak out instead of day off like karen cameron fry's best day ever where like we get to see him and hear like the internal like dialogue of man i hate ferris why is he making me do these things but also i love it like (laughs) an interesting point of view piece just saying it's true and and i think that we need to touch base on when camera went canada went catatonic because i that that was always one of the weirdest parts of the movie to me. Even even now watching it, the whole pool scene is just kind of I don't know. It's like what? I, I, yeah. I still don't get it. I wrote, "Oh no, are we contemplating suicide? This is not what you should do on your day off." Like, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that was really scary. Like we see him looking in the water, and like he plays it off like, oh, I totally got you, man. Like, I got you. Ha ha. But it's like, no, but I think you really like broke a little bit. I think you really had a moment there, bud. Like, that's pretty scary. I do too. And like, I think that he definitely snapped when the whole car thing happened. But I feel like it was Sloan, Sloan in the hot tub, her words, you know, though weren't, they weren't all that inspirational, but it was her saying like, you know, I can flip out real easily too saying like you know someone who is as put together and as accomplished as sloan is can also you know be experiencing what cameron was feeling that that kind of brought him you know you know sobered him up a little bit and then he played the joke of pretending to kill himself or he genuinely did want to kill himself and was seeing he was testing how strong of a friendship ferris had to him 
Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure you could argue this a thousand different ways, right? Like the fact that he just kind of was like in shock and like realizing everything that had happened and just couldn't function because he was in such shock and then kind of came to maybe like underwater and or you could play it like, oh, yeah, he knew the whole time and he was just like, you know, jerking Ferris around because Ferris kind of jerks him around and like he's just going to be like, see what happens. But um, yeah, I had no idea like what we were trying to portray at the end of the day like what I'm, I w- would love to know what the writers of the scene were truly thinking that Cameron was thinking um, while he was staring at the water while sitting again also Ferris Bueller worst friend ever award I know we'll put our totally like stunned slash paralyzed friend on a diving board that doesn't sound like a bad idea what what are we doing no. I, 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 I totally agree. And it's like, it's like, yeah, that's probably the last place where you want to put someone who is having a, he's going, he's going through a major, you know, life freak out. Um, but also, and, you know, sticking on, on the same vein of Cameron being a jokester or whatever. And I don't know if it's, you know, the lens of 2020 and I find it creepy, but when Sloan was like, Cameron, when I was changing, did you, did you look? And he's like, <laughs> yeah. And then, yep. and then like nothing happened from that. It's like, Oh man. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a thing. And I, I wish I had like a word for it, but it's like, yeah, it's called, it's context now. Right. Like, like we've advanced about 20 years. Well, more than that now it's 2020 mm-hmm. we've advanced and we realize that things like that probably aren't great. Right. Cameron, like maybe we shouldn't, maybe we don't do that. Maybe we don't do that. Yeah, maybe we don't do that. And and like I don't know. I, I was whenever I watched that, I'm either thinking, yeah, like A, nineteen eighty five was a long time ago, or B, Sloan and Ferris are just the coolest, you know, polyamorous couple ever and are like, Yeah, you know, fuck it, whatever. Right. And there's like a line there, right, where it's like if you I don't know how long that Sloan and Ferris have been together, but like if they're super tight and Cameron is the best friend, like you kind of become like I don't want to say a threesome, like wink nudge, but like you become kind of a unit in yourself. And so it's like, maybe Ferris doesn't feel threatened by Cameron. Like it's all friendship. Like, Hey, no, we're cool. Like we're all best friends. I've got your back. You've got mine. Like kind of thing. Like I could see that, but yeah, yeah not the greatest line. In <laughs> no, or ever. Definitely not. No, of course not. not stellar. <laughs> but I want it. Well, we skipped over now that we went forward into the pool scene. We totally skipped over the the float and the. Uh, oh, Donka Shane. Yes. Donka Shane. So here we are, Ferris Bueller. You're trying to get away with not getting caught. You even go through the effort of putting like a dummy in your bed and the string and the snoring machine. And <laughs> you say, I know. I will jump on this float in the parade in the city. And I, I mean, I guess, again, it's it's 2020. Social media, not a thing, right? Like, you could actually get away with this in 1986 because no one really necessarily was going to capture it. I mean, we did have cameras and also television. But, like, not everybody had a camera in their pocket like we do in 2020. Goodness, no. And, and and there was no circulation if any video was, was uh, taken. So, no. no it, it's just he he is just such a i don't know like like again it's the whole parade float scene is another part of the movie which is it's just a little out of place but mm-hmm. it but it makes the movie what it is it is so funny yeah and i mean like they've got the girls have a choreographed dance to twist and shout which is yes. seemingly like spontaneous but apparently not Mm -hmm. um and apparently i learned this too in my all my deep diving um back to school opened the same weekend as ferris bueller and that also had twist and shout in it oh and so the song now is in two big movies at the exact same time and apparently twist and shout re-entered the billboard charts 16 years after the beatles had actually broken up which was actually 20 years after they covered the song. So 20 years after this song even came out, it's back on the charts. <laughs> and like the Beatles aren't even a thing because they had already broken up over a decade before. That is crazy. So funny. And 
Paul McCartney said it was fine, like, to use it, but then he got mad. Of all things, he was like, oh, there's too much brass. I don't like that we use too much brass in this version. Oh, like, whatever. Really? You had, like, German-looking girls in, like, sexy milkmaid costumes, and you're like, oh, there's too much brass. Like, okay, Paul. Sounds great. <laughs> not you, Paul. The other, the Beatles, Paul. Not, not, yeah. not me, Paul, but the Beatles, Paul. Wow, that was so good. Uh, no, it wasn't, talking, but thank you. Is this Paul McCartney? Am I talking with Paul McCartney? <laughs> No. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, no. I'm, <laughs> I I I love the um yeah, I love the parade float scene. I mean really, yeah, really great. Iconic. It is truly iconic. Cameron just comes around. Cameron just comes around. Exactly. But in any case, we we get the Ferrari back. Um mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we also see like inner cuts of like possible threat. So possible threat one, as we know, is Rooney. He starts to figure it out. He goes to their house, which again, creepy all around, like things that principals should not do. Mm -hmm. Go over to a student's house for no reason. Ring their doorbell and threaten them. Sneak around their house. Try to scale the side of their house. Get like hurt their dog in like a yes. legitimate way. Like, yeah. break into their house. Like, all of these things, right? Like, are like, that's terrifying. We also have the scene where, like, mom comes home because Rooney was on the phone and said, hey, like, just so you know, your son was absent nine times. Nine, nine times. times. Nine times. Um, and so she comes home, but she falls for the prank. Then we've got Jeannie figuring it out, right? So we see all these, like, inner cuts of threats. Mm -hmm. And then we see Jeannie come home because she finally figures it out and also gets fed up with everybody trying to, like, save Ferris Bueller, which, again, very solid, like, C-level plot of, <laughs> hey, the whole school is in love with this dude and half of them don't know who he is. Um, and then Jeannie kicks Bruni in the face. And it's amazing. <laughs> It is. And it's Jeannie leads to one of my favorite lines of, of, you know, or one of my favorite quotable lines where it's like to, you know, to, to whomever's in the house, I just want to let you know, I've called the police. I also have my father's handgun and I have a scorching case of herpes. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. It's, it's great writing. Well, and then there's the like through the lens of 2020 that feels really a little bit uncomfortable when she calls the police and the police don't believe her that someone is in the house. Truly, that felt yeah. a little wrong, a little bad, felt a little bad, a little, a little too close to home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I guess I understand why we don't need police to show up in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, right? Like it would the movie would not do well. I don't I don't think it would just be it would go in a very serious direction at a time that we just didn't need it. But mm -hmm. yeah, it didn't feel great. And then she's like hiding under her comforter the whole time instead of trying to like figure out who's in her house. Yeah, um, or like escape, yeah. Yeah, which you would have thought she would have like recognized him. Like he's a very like I don't know, unique looking man, right? He's a and 6 foot 7 you, ginger, yeah. Tall, right. Yeah, like he's huge. So she just hides the whole time. But in any case, it's just a lot of weird stuff that I'm like, okay, why does the principal need to be like all up in this house right now? Yeah. It's just weird. It is. It is super weird. But, you know, on the, again, on the, on the, on the flip side, Jeannie kind of gets her moment of catharsis too, you know, where she finally comes around and realizes that Ferris isn't a bad guy. He's just, you know, trying to enjoy what he has, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think you had described it to me as like everyone got exactly what they needed and nothing more, and that's like a beautiful way to describe everybody's journey. Mm -hmm. And while they have very small character arcs, I think Cameron, like you said, has the best arc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of <all> yeah, of <laughs> like they do, except maybe Rooney doesn't really get what he needs, right? Like he ends up on a bus without. Well, who knows? Maybe it is what he needs. Maybe you know he needs the humility of. You know, you left a whole school of kids alone because you are fixated on busting one kid. You know, it's yeah. maybe that is what he needs was the humility of it all. And he certainly got that. That is for sure. Oh, good Lord. He really did. But can we talk about Charlie Sheen now? Because I feel like we're, <laughs> we're kind of there. I, um, I, I think we should. I think we need to. We need to talk about Charlie Sheen. So I screamed like, what? I did not expect to see Charlie <laughs> Sheen in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, 
Of course, I Googled it because like what basically I Googled was Charlie Sheen on drugs during Ferris Bueller's Day Off because I feel like that's a fair Google search to go through. (laughs) The answer is apparently no, that he was not on drugs. Instead, he decided to stay up for 48 straight hours in order to achieve his like very strung out Charlie Sheen look, Mm -hmm. which knowing what I know about Charlie Sheen, I feel like he didn't need to do that necessarily to achieve that look but here we are and here we are um, but apparently too there was supposed to be like a whole backstory for his character that's mm-hmm. extended so far as to the vermont family that ferris's mother was showing the house to was actually charlie's family that was supposed yes. to be the backstory and you knew that yes that is that is something that i that i have known um a little you know cool piece of cinema which never happened and it just goes to show that you know these movies there's sometimes so much left on the cutting room floor that is just gold and would have you know enriched the story further yeah well it would have just taken it in such an interesting direction like i think this is i mean not anymore right because it's too it's too late now we've missed the window to bring back like matthew broderick and all these characters but especially yeah. Tom Sheen. but like oh God, yeah we could have achieved a not great but not terrible sequel to ferris bueller's day off to like extend some of these storylines like i would have loved to watch or we could have had genie bueller's day off right like she sneaks out of school to go like hook up with her like badass boyfriend charlie sheen like i would have watched that movie right but at at the same time at at the same time you know the movie gave every character what they needed and and nothing more but didn't it also give the audience everything it needed and nothing more. <gasps> Paul. What? what? My mind is blown. <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. That's and like when I hear people say that they want to remake or no sorry or like reboot Ferris Bueller and do or do like a a shot for shot remake. I feel like it's one of those movies that just cannot be touched. You know, it's 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 perfect as it is. Let it go. Move on. Yeah. I mean I am glad that they didn't we don't have another Ferris Bueller reboot or like the Mm -hmm. weird, like, Oh, remember when this movie was so great, we recreated it with all new characters. Like, no, don't do that. Like we don't need to do that. But in any case, I feel like we have to talk about Cameron Cameron's moment. Yes. When he like talks about how like, he's really going to miss everybody. And I really just wanted vitamin C's graduation playing in the background. Like (laughs) he's going to miss all his friends and like, you know, everybody's going to move on. And like, am I really going to see you all again? And he like, takes a stand against his dad and he's like no i'm gonna take the fall for it and ferris is like don't worry i could do it and it's like are you going to though ferris like i don't think he would have yeah no i i don't think he would have either um and you're right it's 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 so sad that you know cameron's had this great day not only has he had fun but you know he's finally confronting his dad about his 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 life and all that but Actually, in, in, in re-watching this, I actually have more pity for Ferris than I do for Cameron. Really? Only be, yeah, only because, I don't know, I, I think that he's skipping school so much because he's realizing high school's coming to an end and he may have peaked. Because you, you, you hear Cameron say to Sloan, you know, what is Ferris going to do a, a, after high school? And Cameron's, Cameron says something like, oh, he'll be flipping burgers. Cameron's going to mm-hmm. college. Sloan's going to stay in high school, but... But when Ferris is gone, I, you know, this, this may be, he, he may be trying to, you know, get in like, like a last hurrah before he inevitably, you know, goes into this, like, me, into like the mediocrity of life, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he definitely, Cameron, I think is much more grounded as we all know. Mm-hmm. And so he's facing this, like, it's not like, in, I don't want to say impending doom. That's a little dramatic, but I think he is as an introvert and clearly has a little depression situation going on, some anxiety, a lot of anxiety. Change is not fun. And we're we're now facing that head on. And mm-hmm. for some reason, busting up a car allowed him to like come out as a beautiful butterfly with a little more security. <laughs> a so, little more security, yeah. Just a little. I mean, who knows? Or, or j- but, just to be grounded, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh gosh! But I mean, um, at the end of the movie, we see 
Ferris basically is the sweetest child ever, you know, and he like, mm. oh, he's perfect. Everything's great. He runs home. He sees Rooney. Which is the whole run home is just one of my favorite scenes ever. What just running, running through the houses and oh, hey, dinner's ready. And like, yes. Just... Oh, my God. Or when you I mean, he runs like through people's backyards and the two like beautiful women and he kind of like, you know, he's going to come back like it's Ferris Bueller. So he comes back. He's like, hi. Hello, so, you're on my list. I'm here. Ferris Bueller. Here. Yes, hello. Which is like, if you're going to have a, I don't know what a sexy name would be, but I can tell you that Ferris Bueller is not a sexy name. <laughs> like, that is not I a know. name that it's like, hey, I'm Ferris, Ferris Bueller. Like, are you though? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is so great. I, I love it. You know, like, 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 like the whole ending of the movie. And then, of, of course, you know, he, he gets to the, to the backyard, he finds Rooney. And then, you know, Jeannie has has her redeeming moment, you know, being, you know, you know, not not being envious of her brother, but appreciating him for, you know, who he is. You know, that was that was that was fantastic. You know, yeah, it was it was honestly, I didn't even see it coming. I don't know if you did when you were, you know, 10 years old watching this movie for the first <laughs> time. But I truly <laughs> thought Jeannie was going to take advantage and not even like be mean about it, but just like kind of take what she's kind of wanted and. I mean, I don't want to say what she deserves because, you know, she's just like, well, I go to school and Ferris doesn't. That's not fair. But I thought that she would really take advantage of the moment to say, like, I finally got you. Like, of all these times that I told mom and dad that you were terrible and that you were skipping and, you know, I finally am proving that I'm not, like, crazy, that I'm not, like, making this up. But instead, mm. she's just, like, the nice older sister. Who's like, but yeah. I think she's a younger sister, right? Because oh, Ferris is a be senior. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, that changes the dynamic in my head for them. Which is also weird that why would the younger child get a car before the older child? Also true. Right. That's a plot hole we need to investigate. We need sure. to investigate it. <laughs> Maybe she's like, well, no, because she does drive by herself. I was going to say we see her driving, obviously, when she speeds home to try to beat Ferris with her mother. But I was going to say maybe she's trying to get her permit, like she has her permit and she can drive a car. But we see her drive to school. Yeah. So interesting. That is interesting. No, but but it's weird that you know you kind of as as the audience perceive her as being older because she's so wrapped up in in you know busting him. It's you know it's it, it it's kind of it's kind of strange you know that the archetype of that person goes to the older sibling. That is true. I didn't even think twice about that until you just said maybe she mm. or she's probably younger. Yeah, because she and she also just feels more mature, right? Because Ferris is setting the bar pretty low for maturity, and this so is very true. you associate like mature girl with like older and kind of being like, "Oh, Ferris, you're my annoying little brother," but really, mm -hmm. like, no, he's the big brother that can get away with stuff for some reason. Well, it's because his parents like think he is, you know, this perfect child. Which good on Ferris for being able to pull all this stuff off and still never getting busted for it. It, it it's true you know and you know the one of the best moments of symbolism in the movie which just kind of encapsulates who he is and like and like the whole day that he had is and, and i don't know if you caught it it's kind of like a throwaway moment but he you know genie lets him in he runs upstairs he strips off his clothes he gets into bed he shoves the mannequin away and as he's pretending to be asleep he hears the the stereo going with the with the snoring on loop and mm -hmm. he takes the base he takes the baseball that he caught at the Cubs game, hits the power button perfectly, and the ball bounces and rolls into a glove. Yes. It's like like that's 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 fantastic. Well, it's also like, I mean, if we want to get real deep, because I'm sh I'm sure this was not what the directors were thinking, but like it's such a metaphor for his life, right? Like exactly. everything is crazy. There's a lot of risk of danger, perceived danger, but yet everything works out just so. Like he doesn't break the stereo. He just turns it off. It mm -hmm. rolls perfectly into the glove where it belongs. Like it just, it just works. And I mean, if Jeannie were to have seen that, I think she would have told on him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> for sure. For sure. Oh man. What a, what a great movie. Well, have you heard, and I wanted to close with this because I mm -hmm. feel like this is right up your alley. Mm -hmm. There is a fan theory about this movie. Are you aware of the theory? Lay it on me. I, I, I don't know now, if I know it. 
of course, this is based on something I found on fantheories.fandom.com. So Mm -hmm. just grain of salt on that. But there is a fan theory out there that is called the Fight Club Theory. And it's basically the gist of it is that Ferris Bueller is not a real person. And he is just a figment of Cameron's imagination. Oh, wow. Like this alter ego. And he's the the Tyler Durden. Oh, my goodness. Yes. And so, quote, Ferris, quote, takes the car, you know, does all these things. But really, Cameron takes the car and Mm -hmm. does all these things that that Ferris would do. And also Sloan is part of his imagination as like his dream girl. And she doesn't maybe she does exist in in real life. And he just imagines her as part of this whole day. But she is not there. Oh, man, that's a little creepy. Right. Oh, my gosh. I never thought about that. But no, that's. That's kind of mind blowing. I, I I love that theory. So that is the theory. If you would like to get way deep down in it, you can on the internet because there's <laughs> lots of places you can read about it. <laughs> but oh that is the the theory I wanted to to throw at the end to have you think on. Oh, a- absolutely, and I and I appreciate you you uh you you telling me that because now I'm now I'm perceiving this in a totally different way. Yes. So rewatch it. Ooh. Knowing that it's one thing. Stay off. Um, sorry, sorry to have interrupted you. One thing that that we didn't touch base on. Did you watch the end credit scene? Mm, remind me what they are again. So, oh, when so, he yes, go ahead. When, so when he when when he comes out in the bathrobe, at like at like the very end after after the credits. Did you watch that? Yes, I did. Oh, got it. Okay. No, that's again. It it's another perfect fourth wall break that that the writers do and 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 that has been spoofed so many times and i mean i i'm not sure if you've seen the movie deadpool yes i have did, all right so did you see the end credit scene of deadpool i did it is it is it is a shot for shot remake with the same wallpaper and everything of deadpool in a robe walking out saying what are you still doing here it shows over that's amazing um mm-hmm. yes i did watch it this time around um and yeah i thought it was a good like final wrap of the fourth wall because it comes out like so strong in the beginning and obviously throughout the whole movie um and i loved it i also now that you say matthew broderick coming out of the shower i forgot to mention there's like a a small matthew broderick six-pack like shower scene that happens like we see him come out and he's like minor minor six-pack action i just feel like i have to mention that because it's like (laughs) this has to be mentioned I mean, that's not something that I normally take away when watching this movie, but I mean, he was what? He was in his early to mid 20s when when they uh, when they filmed it. So, yeah, I mean, he was in awesome shape. Yeah, they had to give it to him. They absolutely had to give it to him. So for all the folks like me who have not seen this movie, but want to make it sound like they've seen this movie, Paul, what is something that you need to know like what's a a classic line or moment there's a lot of them in this movie i mean everybody knows the ben stein bueller line Mm -hmm. you know that's that's pretty classic i think singing dunkashin or twist and shout is pretty important i don't know i'm you know looking back there's so many iconic moments in the movie which you can take away and I don't know, kind of like dissect, you know, what's important and what's not. Um, when, whenever I think of Ferris Bueller, I always think of, and I know that we didn't really touch base on it, but um, the art museum and how it, 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 you know, the, the movie kind of slows down, it slows down at that point, but, you know, especially Cameron with like taking in the, uh, the pointillism, uh, I forget the name of the painting, but really diving into the, to the detail of the pointillism and realizing that, you know, he is just one dot in this whole grand, grand scheme of things, which also parallels them at the top of Sears tower. I'm not going to call it Trump tower, the top of Sears tower (laughs) when they're all standing on the railing head on the glass, looking over it, you know, Cameron gets that feeling of he's just a piece in all of this. He like, he like, I don't know that like life is kind of like life is bigger than what he's making it to be. So that's, that's actually what, what I kind of uh, 
associate the movie with. But if there's a line that we didn't mention that I've that I absolutely love, it's when Rooney is getting a slice of pizza, um, and or, or no, no, it wasn't pizza. It, it was a hot dog, and he's watching the Cubs game, and as he's like looking away, Ferris pops up on the screen at at, at the Cubs game. Um, but uh, he, he he's ordering the hot dog and he's talking to the chef and he's like, and he's like, who's winning? Oh no 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 sorry he goes he goes what's the score and he goes and he goes tied zero zero, and and he goes who's winning and the chef goes, the Bears. <laughs> like, it's one of my that was very funny. One of my that favorite most most underrated lines in the whole movie. That was pretty funny. I mean, it's just the funny, like, he's so preoccupied that, like, he can't even do conversation well. Like, very, very funny. Exactly. It is very, very true. Yeah, there's there's so many iconic lines. I think we've definitely covered them. Like, just know that Ferris stole a Ferrari. And then if you want to really pretend like you've seen this movie, drop the fan theory on them that, you know, yeah. you, that maybe can't that maybe Ferris is just a figment of Cameron's imagination. So I always have to kind of answer if this movie has lived up to the hype and if I deserved all the ridicule that I have received for not seeing the movie. Um, (laughs) I think it's definitely lived up to the hype. Like it's like you said, it's not really a movie about nothing, but it's a feel good movie about nothing. Like this is the movie that if I'm feeling like, oh, what do I want to watch today? Like I'll watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like it's like The Office, but a movie like I'll just watch The Office again. Oh, I can watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off again. So I think it's like a solid, I mean, if I had to give it stars, like a solid like four and a half out of five. Like I love that. Not and a lot it, of plot, but it was good. <laughs> and it's funny, I was actually ju- just about to ask you, being a first time viewer, if you had to rate it like out of 10, what would you rate it as? And and no, I, I think that's an astute uh, observation. I think that's a great, great rating. I mean, I'm... I'm so glad that a you're doing this podcast, but b that you're that like you've seen this movie, which I again I've quoted probably I don't know like since since I've known you again it's been what twelve thirteen years but like uh, I have been quoting this movie since we became friends so finally it's like oh wow cool she gets it I get it now and you <laughs> you dealt with me all this time well I'm excited to do this too and Paul it was so great to have you to talk about this movie with I'm glad we got this cool anecdote about like how tall the principal actually was Um, but thank you so much for making me watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off thank you so much for having me this has been such an awesome experience and uh, can't wait to be a part of the next one Jackie Watches Stuff is supported by our listeners I'd like to thank our supporters in the Academy on Patreon. They are Jarrett S., Linda V., Bree S., Missy V., Paul H., Logan B., and Tom S. Thank you so much for your generous ongoing support of this show. If you'd like to join the Academy and get a shout out for supporting us, visit patreon.com slash Jackie Watches Stuff. You can also support the show by submitting a review on your podcast player or sharing it with your family and friends. Jackie Watches Stuff is hosted by me, Jackie Vetrano, and produced by Sean Flynn. You can find Sean on Twitter at WXGeek. Jackie Watches Stuff is available wherever you listen to podcasts, or you can listen online at JackieWatchesStuff.com. You can also send us your thoughts on Ferris Bueller's Day Off on Twitter. We're at Jackie Watches. Thanks for listening. Join me next time. I'll be watching Titanic. <laughs>